Okay, there's still lots of people um, uh, logging in, but I'll perhaps just start with a, a little introduction before we move into the workshop proper. So these uh, webinars started in 2020 as part of the Open Chemical Sciences Week that the uh, that CCAG held. Um, they actually proved extraordinarily popular, and so we felt it would be a good idea to extend them uh, in, as individual workshops once a month for all of 2021. So in, including the original set that we had at the uh, meeting in 2020, th this will be the 12th workshop and we've covered a huge variety of, of uh, topics from protein modeling through uh, molecular visualization, workflows uh, and a variety of other things. Today, uh, we're going to have a, a workshop in looking at um, chemomatics and art machine learning from Pat Walters. This uh, has proved to be, if anything, the most popular uh, workshop, certainly based on the number of people who have registered. The way that we run the workshop is to have um, a break after one hour so people can get up and uh, have a little walk around and stretch their legs. If you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A uh, box uh, and not the chat box. Uh, we will monitor the Q&A box and uh, try and answer questions uh, in real time. Um, we have a couple of people who can uh, answer simple questions and if there's anything more complex we'll pass it on to, to Pat to uh, discuss during the uh, presentation. So with no further ado I think I'd like to hand over to Pat. This is going to be a, a, a bit of a tour de force in terms of uh, the technology I think so uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed and uh, over to you. All right thanks Chris can you hear me? Yes perfectly. All right, great. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. I'm thrilled that so many people are interested in this topic. It's a little bit of pressure. I will try to do my best here. So let me start out by sharing my screen. Hopefully that is visible. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, great. So welcome. So what we're going to do today is spend a couple of hours talking about how we can do cheminformatics with open source software. I don't think that in two hours I can completely teach you how to do cheminformatics with open source software, but hopefully I'll give you an idea of what's possible and give you an introduction and some good places to start. So I'm hoping to make this an interactive tutorial. It doesn't necessarily have to be interactive. If you care to just watch, that's perfectly fine, but I think you'll learn more if you play along. So I've used a tool and website called Binder to set up all of the materials for this particular course. I believe that with your registration, you got a link to this, but if you didn't, um, if you go to github.com slash Pat Walters, that's my personal GitHub site. I've so, also put, it, put the details in the chat for everybody as well. So the, okay, the link's perfect. there, they can just follow. Yeah, but... If you want to, also, you can go to github.com slash Pat Walters, go to the link right there that's pinned for Chem Tutorial. If you click on that, that'll take you to the GitHub page with all the materials. If you scroll down, there will be a link there that says Launch Binder. So if we look at that, what we're doing is something like this. Let me just get some of this stuff out of the way. Uh, okay, so let me, I wanna leave that open, but yeah. So if you go to github.com uh, slash Pat Walters, you go here. If you click on this chem tutorial link, and then if you scroll down a bit, you'll see this link for launch binder. 
What that will do is it will launch the binder environment. It's going to create a virtual machine for you that has all of the software that you'll need installed. So you don't need to install anything to follow along. All you really need is a web browser. You can do something similar with Google Colab, which is another environment that enables you to run these Jupyter Notebooks from your web browser. The difference here is that with Colab, you have to install software and that can be a bit tricky with some of the software that we're using. So we're just going to run this all from Binder. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes. Hopefully in those few minutes that I'm talking, your Binder environment will come up and we can all just follow along and do this together. So just a little bit about me. I've been working as a computational chemist in drug discovery for the last 25 years. I've been writing software for the last 35 years or so. Um, and for the last couple of years, I've been writing a blog called Practical Chem Informatics, where I try to share some of my ideas as well as provide some tutorials on both fundamental and advanced topics in chem informatics. I've been working in machine learning since before it was a fashionable thing to do. I can't say that I was particularly insightful. I just got lucky. Um, but you know, I've got a shot here of the first machine learning paper I published in 1993. I've programmed in a lot of different programming languages. I'd say for the last five years, I've been programming in Python. I think Python has become the default language now for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science. So if, if you're not an expert Python programmer, that's OK. We're going to go through things at a relatively fundamental level. So, you know, my goals with this, what do I want to do? Like I said, I can't in two hours teach you all of chem informatics, but I want to show you that there's a lot that's possible now using open source software. I want to show you that this is not really all that complicated. And you know, there's been a tremendous amount of talk and hype around artificial intelligence in drug discovery. So we're going to work through a couple of relatively simple machine learning examples. And my goal here is to show you that this is not all that complicated. And hopefully I can demystify some of artificial intelligence for you. Um, so, so you Pat, Pat we, we're getting, uh, some people are finding a message saying too many people using Binder. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that there was a limitation. I no, guess. I, I, I have no idea, I'm afraid. I don't. Um, okay. Um, I didn't realize that there was a limitation on Binder, to be perfectly honest. I've never done this with more than 20 people. So, I guess my suggestion there would be if you can't get into Binder and just watch what we're doing, this is going to be up on YouTube later as a video and you could follow along there. You can also get the notebooks and try them later on Binder. What I'll also do is on the GitHub site, I will put up some instructions in the next couple of days that explain to you how to install all of this and run it on your own computer. So my apologies if we've reached a limit with Binder. I didn't realize that that was going to be a thing. Yeah. So it might sorry. be just so many people just trying to log in at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say keep trying, but my apologies. So. What are the prerequisites for this? There's not a lot. You know, I, it'd be good if you had 
perhaps seen Python programming before, but you know, you de definitely don't need to be an expert Python programmer to do any of this. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about organic chemistry. So some knowledge about what an organic molecule is, is good, but you know, more than anything, I just want you to have a desire to learn and to see what this is all about. Uh, so what are we gonna cover? We're going to give you a brief introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we're going to get a whirlwind tour of the RE kit, which has become over the last five or six years, the default, I think, for open source chem informatics. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Pandas library, which is one of my favorite tools for data analysis both in cheminformatics and just for general data science. Uh, we'll go through an example of how we can build a decision tree as a classification model. And then we'll take a look at a regression model. I wanna give credit to the person who published the cartoon on the right uh, in, on Twitter. Because I think this is this is a really important thing when you start talking about data science, whether you're talking about chem informatics or in other fields. One of the most important things you're going to have to do is cleaning your data and understanding your data. And that's going to enable you to ask, ask the questions that you want to ask. So we'll go through a little bit of how we can use the Pandas library to do this data cleaning and analysis. Um, this is not going to be an advanced treatise on machine learning. So, you know, if you want to learn about neural networks or learn molecular representations or how we can use generative models, you've come to the wrong place. So this is gonna be a basic tutorial. There are a lot of advanced concepts. Some of these I've written about in blog posts. The other thing we're not gonna to do today is cover a lot of theory. I'm gonna to try to explain to you in some cases what's going on under the hood, but um, there's, you know, we're not gonna spend a lot of time doing theoretical derivations. There's a question on the chat about uh, the YouTube recording. So I will post that up on Twitter as soon as it's available. I'm sure that Chris will also post it and I'll post it on LinkedIn. So if you just follow me on Twitter, you'll see a link to the video very probably Chris said it will be posted next week. Yeah, it'll be up there next week. I'll put a, a link to the uh, uh, the channel in the uh, uh, as a response to the question and uh, it'll be there next week. Okay. Uh, just I wanted to give you a few resources that I think are valuable uh, for learning about data science learning a little bit about chem informatics. Um, the first is a book by Wes McKinney, who is the author of the Pandas Library for Data Science in Python. This is a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Second thing is if you're going to do data science, I think it's crucial that you have an understanding of statistics. Data science in the absence of statistics is a recipe for disaster. So I really like this book because it approaches things from a very practical standpoint and has lots of code examples showing statistical concepts that you can use. Finally, uh, there's a book if you're interested in deep learning I co-wrote this book with a few friends of mine. I think it's a good resource as an introduction to deep learning, how deep learning is applied in a variety of fields in life science. It doesn't just focus on things like chem informatics or quantitative structure activity relationships. So I think it's a good introduction
Uh, the other thing that I want to point you to is the RD kit, which I think is a fantastic resource for doing chem informatics. It's completely open source and available. One of the best resources there is the RD kit cookbook. So if you're looking to do something, somebody probably already did it and they may have already put that up as a recipe example in the cookbook. So I'd strongly recommend taking a look at that. Uh, there are a number of blogs that are useful. By the way, all these slides are on the GitHub site. So it's there as a PDF. So don't worry about having to write down links or anything. So there is my blog, which I think is, is good, provides a lot of useful code examples. There's a guy, uh, Iwaki B. Pen in Japan, who writes lots of great posts with code examples. The RD Kit has its blog, Greg Landrum, who is the primary maintainer of the RD Kit shares lots of useful information there. And then there are a number of other groups that have blogs that I find useful. So you may want to check these out. Like I said, slides are in the GitHub repo and please check out those links. Uh, finally, if you're just interested in data science, there is a great YouTube channel by a guy who goes by the moniker of the data professor. And he has, his posts are not primarily around cheminformatics, although he does have a couple of posts that touch on cheminformatics and bioinformatics, but great information, fundamentals of Python. He shows a lot of interesting Python libraries and how to use them. So again, highly recommended there. So we're gonna to talk today about AI. And I think I've been, I started working on various aspects of artificial intelligence in the mid 1980s. And I still don't have a great definition of what it is, but I saw this on Twitter. I really like it. Uh, you know, if it's written in the Python programming language, it's probably machine learning. If it's written in PowerPoint, it's probably AI. So don't have a great definition for you there, but when we talk about machine learning, I really like this definition from Cassie Kasakrov, who's the chief decision scientist at Google. And what she says is machine learning is all about labeling things using examples. So if we think about our field and we think about chemistry, this is what you're doing typically when you're doing machine learning. So I'm given a set of molecules and their associated, let's properties. So let's say that we're looking at something like aqueous solubility. So I've got a set of molecules and those molecules are labeled as whether they're soluble or not soluble. What I want to do then is learn from those examples and look at the labels there. So let's say that the label is soluble or insoluble. And I want to look at how I can apply that label to a new example molecule. And if we look at machine learning, we typically divide this into two categories. We've got supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. So the way that I tend to think about this is supervised machine learning, I have both an X variable, a set of X variables and a Y variable. And I want to identify the relationship between the X variables and the Y variables. So I want to do a prediction. So I've got a set of characteristics of molecules and I want to predict whether they're going to be metabolized by a cytochrome P450. Unsupervised machine learning is just having a set of X variables and trying to group and understand your data. So typically this gets divided into two different categories. We've got dimensionality reduction. So I've got a set of 
characteristics of molecules, and let's say I've got 10 dimensions, I can't easily visualize 10 dimensions. So what I want to do is reduce the dimensionality to understand the data and get this into a two-dimensional plot. And what I want to have is this plot where sim similar molecules are grouped together. Molecules that are different will be far apart. By the same token, I can use techniques like clustering, where I want to group a set of molecules together. So a great example of where I might apply this is, let's say that I want to build a library of molecules for high throughput screening. And from vendors, there are 2 million molecules available, but I only have the budget to buy 100,000 molecules. So how do I decide which 100,000 molecules to buy? Well, one way to do that would be to take those 2 million molecules, cluster them into 100,000 clusters, and then pick a representative molecule from each cluster. So supervised machine learning, you're predicting. Unsupervised machine learning, you're trying to group and understand your data. So what we're going to talk about today is primarily supervised machine learning. We may end up diving a bit into a, an example of unsupervised learning when we talk about ways to understand our data. But if we're looking at supervised machine learning, you can kind of think about this as just a souped up version of linear regression. So I have a set of X variables and I want to find the relationship between those X variables and some observable Y. So that observable could be the biological activity. So I'm looking to predict a biochemical IC50 or whether a molecule will block the herd channel, which is implicated in cardiotoxicity, or whether I'm trying to predict metabolic stability. I've got a set of X variables, which are characteristics of my molecule, and I've got a set of Y variables, which is some experimental observable. Now, if you think about the way that we typically do machine learning, in a lot of fields, the way that we represent objects is well established. So if I'm doing machine learning on images, if I'm at Google and I'm trying to identify cat pictures, there's a well established way to represent these molecules as vectors for a machine learning model. You can simply represent the intensity of pixels or the color of the pixel. So that's relatively well established. If we're looking at text, you know, there are ways of coming up with groupings of words, and that representation is pretty well established. But how do we encode a molecule? So how do we take a molecule and represent it in a way typically as a numeric vector that can be represented in a computer and processed by a machine learning algorithm. So how do I take this molecule and convert it into a set of X variables? So we could just calculate a bunch of features of the molecule. So we could calculate things like the lipophilicity of the molecule, its polar surface area. We could come up with measures of its shape. Another way to do that is a technique that we call molecular fingerprints. So in a molecular fingerprint, there are a number of ways to do this, but one of the simplest is to create a dictionary of molecular features. And then you can create a vector to represent the molecule based on those features. So if the molecule has the feature, you would put a one in a particular column in the vector. If it doesn't have it, you'd put a zero. So if we look over here, both of these molecules have a phenyl ring, so you'd put a one there. Now, if you look at this one, the ketone, you'd say one of these molecules has a ketone, the other one doesn't. So you could put those features, you could do the same with this ester feature. So then once we have these molecules, 
represented as what we call feature vectors, then what we can do is we can come up with a relationship between these features, which is our X, and then some experimental value, Y. So we're gonna take this feature vector together with our experimental value, and we're going to train our machine learning model. Then once we've trained the machine learning model, we can take new ligands. So let's say I've got some ideas for molecules that I want to synthesize. Then I can take those, use those idea molecules, calculate their features and predict the new Y value. All right. Enough talking, let's just jump into this now and let's actually get into a Jupyter Notebook. So hopefully some of you at least have been able to load up the binder environment. So I'm gonna go over to mine. So the first thing that we wanna do is we're just gonna just get a little bit of an introduction to Jupyter Notebook. So just to start this out, what I want you to do is go over here to where it says new, and then just say new Python 3. So if you click on new Python 3, oh, that's not good. All right. Um, I may have to just set up a new look. I'm just going to run all this locally on my machine. So my apologies. Hopefully some of you are actually able to start this up. And like I was saying, so yeah, you just want to go new, Python 3, and we're going to start it up a new environment. Oh, okay, let me see. There's a couple of questions here. How does machine learning compare with the approaches used by a medicinal chemist where they know that there are moieties that can be useful and which are problematic? That's a good question, actually. And that, that was a, an area of active research about 20 years ago, a lot of us started putting together methods for predicting and identifying drug-like molecules. So one of the things that you can do is you need a set of labeled examples. So let's say that I had a set of molecules and I gave them to chemists and the chemists looked at these molecules and said, okay, these look drug-like, these don't look drug-like, or these appear to be problematic, you could then train your machine learning model to identify those problematic molecules. You can do that. What most of us end up doing in practice, and I, I have a blog post that I wrote about this, um, is just coming up with lists of problematic functionality. And like I said, I've got a blog post and I've got a GitHub repo associated with that where there are lots of examples of those. But we have many of us in the past um, published papers on this and I can, I can put a couple of links to that when I put together the notes for this. Uh, next question, there are so many- well, I was gonna say actually, uh, one of the, the, the things about doing it computationally is that you you avoid personal bias as well yeah yeah that that's that's interesting there was a paper that uh jerry majora who's a who was a computational chemist at pharmacy and up john and is now a professor at university of arizona published where he gave lists of molecules to about a dozen different medicinal chemists and asked them to rank them and the rankings were very inconsistent. So you're right, Chris, there is often a, a lot of subjectivity to how medicinal chemists. Um, okay, uh, next question. There are so many chemical descriptors to be used. You are right. 
Um, when I tell people about, uh, about machine learning, I think there, there are three things you need to consider. The first is your data. If you don't have good data, you're not going to be able to build a good model. So you need to make sure you have good data. You make, need to make sure that you understand <clears throat> the errors in your data and, and what it means. The next thing is the representation. So how am I representing a molecule in my machine learning algorithm? That, that matters, but it matters less than you think it would. And I find that, you know, in my work, what I usually do is I start out with the default descriptors and the Morgan fingerprints from the RD kit. And I find that by tweaking descriptors, you'll get slight changes in performance, but it's not huge. So my recommendation is the defaults that are available in the RD kit seem to work quite well. Um, next question, what if a molecule has two or more of some features? You can encode that. So what I showed you was a binary fingerprint where you just put a one or a zero in there. You can also have count fingerprints where instead of using ones and zeros, you can actually put the number of features that are, are there. Again, I've, I found it doesn't usually make that much of a difference. Um, let's see. Uh, I saw PLS quite common in a book on chem, for, chem informatics. Why is that? So yeah, partially squares was a very popular technique in the, yeah, I'd say in the early 1990s. Um, it's not quite as popular. These days, most people tend to use things like ensemble methods or neural networks. I mean, I think partially squares is a fine method to use their open source implementations. But again, I guess back to my original point where I said data representation, and then the third component of that is algorithms. And the way that I look at things is that's the order of importance. So your data is the most important thing. Then it's how you represent the molecules. Finally, it's the algorithm. So I think the algorithm is probably the least important part of this. Typically, if there's a signal in your data, you'll find it with just about any algorithm. And I like to focus on at least starting out with simpler algorithms. Um, rather than going to something super complex. Um, is there any literature that this approach is more beneficial than an ad hoc approach? I guess we're talking there about identifying drug-like molecules. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's somewhat subjective and even the notion of drug likeness is somewhat subject subjective. So, you know, I like just using sets of encoded filters because I understand what I'm getting. Um, which binary fingerprint do you think is best to use? I don't think it makes a huge difference. I tend to, when I'm building machine learning models, I tend to use the Morgan fingerprints in the RD kit coupled with the RD kit descriptors. I, I think that that works pretty well. Um, in drug discovery field, it seems to be more common to use chemical properties as descriptors. I'm wondering if there are cases in which it would be more important to build a descriptor based on 3D structure. Okay. I, I, I could go off on this for hours. Um, I agree with you. 3D is important. The problem there is that nobody has really figured out how to encode multiple conformers into a 3D descriptor. 
you know, it, what you'll find typically is if you try a simplistic approach where you're just doing something like averaging or even getting more sophisticated and Boltzmann weighting your 3D conformers, you'll find that you get results that are roughly equivalent to what you get using 2D. So 3D is still a big open question. Um, next question is, is a really good one, is how many compounds do you need to build a meaningful machine learning model? And the, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, it depends on the diversity of the molecules that you're working with, how well the descriptors you're using capture the endpoint that you want to look at. So, you know, what my, you know, I've found cases where I've been able to build meaningful models with 50 compounds. That's kind of the, the low end of where I get comfortable. Um, but I've also found cases where I've had thousands of molecules and I haven't been able to build a machine, a meaningful model. So I guess in my mind, it's just try it and see. And you know, hopefully that'll learn. Um, let's see, can you share from your experiences what kind of data you determine these are good and can be used to further develop the model? Um, I, yeah, I think what, what I find is most important when you're building a model is understanding your experimental data and understanding the confidence that you have in the experimental data. So it's really important to look across multiple replicates of your experimental data and see what the error is. Because if you're looking to build a machine learning model and you've got tenfold error in your experimental data, then it's gonna be very difficult to build a reliable model. So you need to look at what the dynamic range of your data is and at what the error in that data is. Um, so next, let's see, can we rely on open source training sets from ML-based predictions? Sometimes maybe. Um, again, this comes back to the relationship between the molecules that you're trying to predict on and the molecules that you're training your model on. So, you know, if you're doing, building a model based on polychlorinated biphenyls, but you're trying to predict on peptides, the molecules are very different. When I give talks on this, I give an example of if I have a model that I trained on pictures of parrots, but then I'm trying to predict something about penguins, it's going to be very difficult. So, you know, there's, there's a lot, and it's actually kind of beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk about today, but there's a whole field looking at the domain of applicability of your model and model confidence. Maybe that's something that we could talk about at, a, at another time. Anyhow, I guess I could continue to answer questions uh, from the chat, but let's, let's actually just jump in and do some stuff. How about that? Um, so hopefully everybody has your Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebooks are, in my mind, the most revolutionary thing that I've come across for doing data analysis in my career. I just love them. I think it's a, a great way. It's not necessarily the best way to develop software, but when you're doing interactive data analysis, it's fantastic. So in the Jupyter Notebook, what you have is a cell and you can just type Python code into that cell. So if I start out with something really simple like two plus three, and then to execute that, I just hold down the shift key and I hit enter. And you'll see that that has been executed. So, you know, the other things we can do is we can assign variables. So we could do X equals two, 
y equals three, x plus y. And then if I hit shift enter again, that code executes. So really nice, really easy. Um, and then, but you can obviously go far beyond this. The nice thing that I like is you can also do plotting inside a Jupyter notebook. Let me make this a little bigger just so it's easier to see. Uh, but you can also do things like plots. So let's just create two variables this time. So we're going to do x equals list range 0, 10. So range is a function in Python that just creates an iterator, which is you can just think of as something that goes through cycles through a loop. So we're going to create a list of the numbers. Actually, range gives you the minimum and not the maximum, but one beyond the maximum. So you'll see now, if I do this, you see I have the numbers from zero to nine. So now let's say that we want, we're gonna do a plot of X versus X squared. Now we could write a loop like this, you know, four I in rate, or let's just do four I in X. Oh, let's just initialize a list, LST equals open square brackets. So I just created an empty list. I can do something like, for i in x list dot append x squared. And then I'm just going to print out list. Oh, I, I killed my variable here. Let's do this again. Uh, wait a minute. Let's see. I'm showing you the hard way to do this, and now you can see why it's the hard way. Let's just do this again. Hang on. Always hard doing this without a net. Okay, so we've got our list X, then we'll just do something like for i in x print i we've got that now we're going to create a list up here list equals pop. and then we'll do list dot append oh i know what i did wrong I squared, and then we'll print out list. Okay, so now we have our list X, uh, but let me show you something. And this is, this, will, this is something that I tend to use a lot. So you'll see it in some of the other notebooks. Uh, one of my favorite tricks in Python is something called list comprehensions. So rather than having to loop over that, and create a list, I can just do something like this. And I can do something like a squared for a in x. And you can see that I got the same thing. So I'm going to assign that to a new variable y. So now I've got a list x and I've got y. So now what I can do is we're going to do, we're going to plot this. So we need to import a Python library to do plotting. There are a couple of Python libraries for plotting. Probably the most popular is a library called matplotlib. Matplotlib is fine. I don't think that the plots that it creates are particularly attractive. So what I tend to do is use a library called Seaborn, which is probably the second most popular uh, Python plotting library. So if I just do something like import Seaborn as SNS, 
then it's going to take it a second to import that. So now I've got <coughs> my Seaborn library. So I can do something like SNS dot scatterplot x equals x, y equals y. And you can see that I now have a scatter plot. Um, and Seaborn has lots of other functions. So if I, instead of doing a scatter plot, I want to do a line plot, I can just do SNS dot line plot x equals x, y equals y, and I get the line plot. Now, one thing that's really useful inside uh, Jupyter Notebooks is if the library that you're using has help associated with it, you can get help because sometimes, you know, I'll forget all the parameters for Seaborn scatter block. But if I just do something like help SNS dot, oh, one other thing that's great in Jupyter Notebooks is that it has tab completion. So if I start typing something, I can hit the tab key. And if there are no more choices, that just auto completed for me. So if I do that, now you can see that I have help on the Seaborn scatterplot function. I've got all of the, I've got all of the parameters and I can just look it up. So, you know, rather than having to go to a web page to look all this up, you can just access the help. A um, couple other things that are really useful on Jupyter Notebooks is that you can include documentation. And this is great because, you know, six weeks from now, you may not remember what you were doing. So if you want to add some notes, you can then just go up here go to insert, say insert cell above. Now I've created a cell above this. Now in Jupyter Notebooks, you can have different types of cells. By default, it's going to be a code cell, but we don't want that cell to be a code cell. In this case, what we wanna do is put some text here. So if we go to the cell, we go down to cell type and we set this to markdown. Then I could say something like here, you know, I'm going to add two and three. And then if I hit shift enter, that goes in there. So it provides a really nice way. And this is a way that I do a lot of the tutorials that are on my blog, but this is what I do every day in my work as I'm doing data analysis and as I'm building machine learning models. All right, so that was your whirlwind introduction to Jupiter. And hopefully I've given you at least a flavor for what we can do. There are a lot of keyboard shortcuts. I put on this slide just my favorites, the ones that I have in my head. So shift enter, remember that's what you use to execute a cell. Escape A will insert a cell above. Escape B will insert a cell below. Escape X will delete a cell. And sometimes I do this by mistake. So the thing to remember is if you go up here to the edit menu, there's something for undoing that delete because you know I'll just get on a roll, I start working and then I just delete a cell that has code that I spent the last 20 minutes writing. Uh, so fortunately you do have the ability to undo that. Um, and then you can convert the cell type back to code. Uh, one other thing you can do is you can execute shell commands with a, an exclamation mark or a bang, as we tend to say. So if I just do like bang ls, then that's going to give me the directory listing for this directory. All right, so there was our intro to this. Let's actually get in and do something fun now.
So what we're going to do is we are going to go to file open and we're going to take a look at the RD kit. So the first notebook just gives you a quick introduction to the RD kit library for <clears throat> doing a variety of chem informatics tasks. So the first thing we do in this notebook is import a bunch of Python libraries. So the first thing is we import, oh, let me make this a little bigger just to make it a little easier for you to see. Hopefully that's good. Uh, so we're going to import the RD kit, which is the, the core library. Um, then we want to be able to draw chemical structures. So importing this IPython console allows us to do that. Uh, you'll see we're going to use some functions for drawing molecules. So we need to import this draw library. Um, then we've got a few settings here. The RD kit, by default, the structures don't look as good as if you set a couple of these flags here. So if we tell it to use uh, scaled vector graphics, the, the plots will look better. And then there's this core gen library that the RD kit has that again, makes the structures look a little better. Later on toward the bottom of this notebook, we're gonna take a look at how we can actually integrate the RD kit with the pandas library for doing data science. And then in the next notebook, we'll talk a little bit more about pandas. And then finally, I'll just give you a quick peek at one of my favorite uh, Python libraries for chemistry. This is a library called malls to grid And it's great because it allows you to put up grids of structures and you can actually make selections from those. You can even substructure search them. So really, really terrific library. Again, completely free and open source. So what we're going to do is hit shift enter there and we're going to then load those libraries. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to start out by just creating a molecule. So there are a couple of common file formats that are used to specify molecules. One of the most common is what's known as a smile string. So smile string is a nice compact way that's sort of human readable of of, depict, of representing a molecule. So what we have here is a smile string that represents benzene. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create this molecule object. Then the really cool thing about the RD kit and Jupyter Notebooks is the Jupyter Notebook now recognizes that this is a molecule. So if you want to just look at it, you just type mol and you know, it'll display it as a structure. So let's just talk a little bit more about smile. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert another cell below this one. So I just hit escape B to create a new cell below the one that I have. Now I'm gonna create just, I wanna give you just kind of a five minute introduction to smiles because it's actually pretty simple. So I'm just gonna do mall equals chem, dot mall. Now you see from smiles. And so at a sim the simplest level in smiles, each element is represented, at least organic elements are represented by their atom symbol. So if I just do CCC. You've missed an equal sign out at the beginning. Oh, that, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Mall equals chem dot mall from smiles. And then I'm just going to put mall down here so I can look at it. And you can see that we created propane. And if I wanted to put an oxygen in there, 
Now I've done CCO and I have ethanol. If you want to insert a double bond, you just use an equal sign to represent the double bond. And you can see that now we have a double bond there. If I want to do a triple bond, I can use a pound sign and you'll see that now we have a triple bond. So I think it's, it's all pretty intuitive. Uh, if you want to put in a branch, you can put in a, use parentheses. So if I do something like C, C, paren, double bond, O, C. So then I've created a ketone. If I wanted to make that into a carboxylic acid, I would just put an oxygen there. And I should have hit shift return rather than return. So let's do that again. So, you know, again, I think relatively simple and intuitive once you get the hang of it. And then the final couple of tricks to this was well, actually a lot more tricks to it, but in our quick whirlwind tour, is rings. So if you put a number in, that indicates a ring closure. So you'll see it's saying that where, where I have the one here, that's bonded to where I have the one there. If I just put in another carbon, now I have cyclohexane rather than cyclopentane. Then finally, if we want to do aromatic rings, aromatic atoms are lowercase. So if I want to do benzene, I could do that. If I want to make benzene into pyridine, I could just change that to a nitrogen. And you can get you know, much more sophisticated with this. Uh, one of the cool things, though, is if you look in Wikipedia, so for instance, if I look at the Wikipedia page for Gleevec or Amatinib, I didn't want to look at CML. Um, usually, if you look down here toward the bottom, you could, they actually have the smile screens for all these drugs. So if you want to get the structure of a drug, you wanted to do some various cheminformatic processing on this, you can just copy that and then go paste that into your Jupyter notebook and you have that chemical structure ready to go. So you know, I copied that smiles. I can then, I've got my Gleevec molecule and you'll see that it can depict it. Uh, as I mentioned, there's really two common formats for specifying molecules in cheminformatics now. There's the smile string. And smile strings are great because they're really compact. You can just put you know, one smile string on a line. It's really easy to deal with those. Uh, but then you're going to have to algorithmically generate the structure. In some cases, you're very interested in how the molecules are oriented. And then finally, in some cases, you want to be able to associate data with a molecule. Now, you can associate data with a smile string by putting it into a CSV file. But the other way to do this is to use what's referred to as a structured data or SD file. So in this <clears throat> example set, I've got an example of an SD file, but let's just take a quick look at what that looks like. So I'm hit escape A and open a cell above the one I have. Now, if I just do, remember, you can use the, the exclamation mark or bang, uh, or no, the, yeah, to execute a shell command. So I'm just going to look at the first 500 lines of that file. So uh, the other thing that's nice is you'll notice that the Jupyter Notebook can do 
completion also on file name. So if I just type, type in EXA and I hit type, it looks and says, well, the only thing you have there is a file called example compounds.sdf. So then if I hit shift enter and execute that, this is an SD file. So I'll just give you just the, the quick whirlwind tour. The first line in the SD file is the title line. Beyond that, we've got some kind of arbitrary text. And then this last part here, 2D, this indicates that this is a 2D structure. If you have 3D, you put 3D there. You have the number of atoms, the number of bonds in the molecule. And then we have the coordinates of the atom. So this is a 2D structure. So I have the X coordinate of the first atom. I have the Y coordinate. Since this is a 2D structure, we just put a zero in that column because there is no Z coordinate there. Then we have the atom type. So if it's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, you can see all of those. And then we've got a bunch of fields over here that we use to specify things like stereochemistry. So I'm not gonna go into depth on that today, but just to give you kind of a brief overview of what you're looking at here. So what we have is the number of atoms here, the number of bonds, and then we'll have this atom block, which describes all the atoms in our molecule. And then below that, we've got the bond block. And then this specifies all the bonds. So you can see that we've got a bond between atom one and atom two. And there's a next is an integer representing the bond order. So I've got atom one bonded to atom two by a single bond. Down here, I've got atom three bonded to atom four by a double bond. So I can just go through all of this. And then at the very end, you'll see this N tag followed by four dollar signs. That means it's the end of the first molecule and we've started the second one. So SD files provide another way of representing molecules. Not gonna get into a lot of depth on that today, but just to give you a quick example. So now what we're gonna do is just read all the molecules from that example file into an SD file. So what we'll do there is, or I'm sorry, we'll read all the molecules from this SD file into a list. So we're gonna use this list comprehension that I talked about before. We could have done this in a list, but it's much simpler to do it this way. So I can just do X for X in chem.sdmol supplier. So what this is, is we're using the RD kit chemistry library and we have this object called an SD mall supplier, which allows you to read all of these molecules from this file called example compounds.sdf. So now what we've done is we've created a list of molecules. If we look at that list, you can see that now, because I've got a list of molecules rather than one molecule, the Jupyter Notebook doesn't know how to display the structures for the compounds. It's just going to show up as a list, and that's not particularly useful. So let's take a look at a couple of functions that we can use to look at those molecules. So in the first case, what we're going to do is we're going to use a function from the RD kit You'll remember at the beginning when we imported, we, Im we did from rdkit.chem import draw. So this is the drawing library for the rdkit. We imported that. Now we want to make this into a grid of structures. So what we can do is call that function with our list of molecules. And we call draw.mols to grid image with our list of molecules how many molecules we want in each row. And then we're going to tell it to use the SDG graphics to just make things look a little bit better. So if I do that and I execute that, oh, we didn't go up here. We didn't actually create this. So we're going to create this list of molecules. We're going to look at it. 
Now we're down here and we'll draw this and you can see that we've got all of these structures drawn now. So we can draw this as a grid. If we wanted to change the parameters and we wanted to look at three molecules per row, we can change that. You know, if we wanted to make it six molecules per row, and then if we took a look up above this, again, remember we can use the help. So we can do help. And then we'll copy that. So it gives you a relatively abbreviated um, description of that. But what we can do then is we could look into the RDK documentation on the website to get a better idea. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to show you is this library called Molster Grid because I just, I use this all the time. It's incredibly useful. And what you do there is you just remember, you see up at the top where we imported malls to grid. Once I've imported malls to grid, then I can go down here and I can just call malls to grid dot display with that same list of molecules. And you can see that now it's displayed all of those molecules in a grid for me. I can page through that grid and look at more molecules this way. So I can go through different pages of that grid, but there's a lot more that I can do with that. I can also go through and search it. And I can do searches for text, but even more importantly, I can do searches for substructures. So if I go over here to search, and then I set this to smarts. So what smarts is, is smarts is a superset of the smiles notation that I showed you before that can be used for searching. And one of the great things is that any valid smiles can also be used as a smarts to do a search. So let's say that I want to search this to find all of the molecules in my set that have pyridine. So if I do remember the smart smiles for pyridine is C1, four more carbons, N1. And now you can see that my list is narrowed down to only molecules that contain pyridine. If I clear that selection, I go back to everything. And then the other thing that I really like about this is I can select things in here. And not only can I select things on one page, I can make some selections. Then I can go to page two. I can select some more molecules. So if I'm looking through this and let's say that I look, I'm looking through a set of molecules and I'm trying to pick things that I want to run in a biological assay, I can just then go that. And then there's a variable called malls to grid dot selection that keeps track of all of those selections. Um, all right, so Chris, we're actually past the first hour. Should we take a, a break? Yeah, I think uh, we, we should do. I just wonder if you want to answer a couple of the questions first and yeah, yeah. a few simple ones to, there, let, and then we, and then yeah, we can take yeah, a break. Let me, let me come back to some of the questions. Um, should the smiles be standardized when using fingerprints based on smiles? Fingerprints should actually be independent of the atom ordering or the canonicalization. So in principle, it shouldn't be necessary to do that, but I find that it never hurts. The one place that you will find that you can get tripped up with fingerprinting though is with tautomers. And if you have different tautomer representations, 
for the same functional group. So it's often, I find, more important to standardize tautomers than it is to canonicalize. Um, okay, would you mind commenting on multiple chemical identification, smiles, inchies, inchy keys, and where they should be used? Um, I've heard of issues with inchies and inchy keys. Inchies are becoming more popular. I, I think it depends on your use case. So there's, there's smiles. One of the things that I like about smiles is that I can look at a smile string, maybe because I've been looking at them for 30 years, and I can sort of see what's going on. There's another representation called, there are two more representations, one called inchy and the other one called an inchy key. Inchy is sort of similar to smiles, but it's not really human readable. I can't tell what's going on. Inchies, though, are better at standardizing molecules. So if I'm building a chemical registration system and I want to make sure that I always have the same representation for a molecule so that I can identify duplicates, um, that to me is a great opportunity to use an inchy. I would use an inchy over a smiles in a, re in a registration system. The other thing though to be aware of with inchies is that an inchy will encode a specific tautomer of a molecule. And often I find that the tautomer that is encoded by the inchy is not the intuitive tautomer that a medicinal chemist would draw. Um, question, how do I create an SD file? You can create an SD file using the RD kit. It has a really good uh, set of tools for that. You can also create SD files from most chemical drawing programs. So if you're using Marvin Sketch or ChemDraw or any one of another of many other drawing programs, you can do that. Uh, there's just to be clear, there's there's SD files and there's MOL files. So an SD file is really a superset of what's referred to as a MOL file. A MOL file is more or less the same format, but MOL files are for encoding one molecule, an SD file is typically used to encode a set of molecules. Yeah, that's a good point there. If you want to find molecules, you can typically find them in, uh, you can go to PubChem, you can go to Kemble, you can go to Wikipedia. So there's, there's a lot there. Um, when I'm building a machine learning model on molecules, do we need to be to consider tautomers? Yes, it's a really good idea to make sure that you've got. I think that the important thing there is to make sure that you're consistent and that you're representing your molecules in a consistent fashion. If you have half of your molecules with one tautomer representation, and the other half with a different tautomer representation, it's going to make things difficult uh, for your machine learning model. Is it possible for machine learning to predict solubility of compounds? Yes, it is. And as a matter of fact, we're gonna go through an example of that. That being said, Predicting aqueous solubility is actually a very difficult problem because you're trying to ultimately understand the energetics of a crystal lattice. In order to do that, you really need to be able to predict that crystal lattice, which is, which is an incredibly difficult problem. So yes, you can come up with estimates of aqueous solubility, but if anybody tells you that predicting aqueous solubility is a solved problem, walk away from that person. Um, 
is it possible to perform feature selection when, when working with fingerprints? You can. Um, we're going to go through an example using building decision trees and using ensemble methods. And a lot of times with methods like random forest or related methods that use multiple decision trees, the nice thing about those methods is that feature selection is implicit in the methodologies. Um, can smiles be open with Vesta or JMOL? I don't know. Um, can we use smiles for polymers or materials? I think so, but it's not really my field. Uh, rate, rate constants for reactions, that's a uh, complete, yes, you can do that. Typically people do that sort of thing using quantum chemistry. So it's not something that we're gonna talk about. Uh, where do you draw the line that machine learning will be useful rather than real experimental work? Uh, so I am a computational chemist. I, the way that I look at my job is that my job is there to design the next experiment. I am not here to replace an experiment. I, you know, I have always said that I only have two jobs. One job is to convince somebody to do an experiment. The other is to convince somebody not to do an experiment. So I look at machine learning as a way to support the decision-making process. It's not a substitute for experiments. Um, can we convert an SD file to smiles using the RD kit and export to get one column of smiles and one column of drug name? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll go through that when we get to the pandas examples. Um, are there examples of natural language processing? Uh, yes, there are natural language processing on smiles and inchy strings. There are a wide array of methods that have been published using smile strings to derive representations for machine learning, um, if that's what you're talking about. Yes, you're right. Look at Ola's work. Um, I highly recommend it. How do you differ with, how do you deal with working with different smiles versions of the same molecule? Typically what you do is you write a function to convert that smiles to its canonical form. So for instance, let's just, Let's take a quick look at an example. So let's create a cell and let's just define a smile, a function. Define smi to can smi. So what I'm gonna do is I'm defining a function that's gonna convert a smile string to its canonical form. So the first thing I have to do is create a molecule. So, with the RD kit, I can do chem dot uh, mol from smiles, smi. Then what I wanna do is I wanna convert that back to a smile string by default, the RD kit will convert that to its canonical form. So we can then just do return uh, chem dot mol two smiles, smile. Let's insert another cell below that. And then I can just do something like smile to can smile. Let's see, double bonds, CC. What did I do wrong?
If anybody sees what I'm doing wrong. Mall from smiles. Oh, I had to see what I did wrong. I was trying to do this. I want to do mall there. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do this. Uh, comma, smy to can smy. And I'll take the same molecule, but I'll put the double bond. What do I have five carbons here? Yeah. Go on C. And you'll see that I got the same representation for both molecules. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, can we use a graph ne neural network with smiles? Typically what you're gonna do if you're using graph neural network with smiles, you're going to be reading those smiles and converting the smiles to a molecular graph and then, um, and then using the graph neural network with that. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you to the person who corrected my code for me. Um, and then how can the program Maybe do you, recognize do you, do you want to let people have a, a break now? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think- Why don't uh, we take five minutes? Yeah. And we'll come back. Yeah. And uh, I, I met, forgot to mention that the, these are, workshops are all sponsored by Liverpool Chirochem and Joshua do you want to just say a few words? Hi can you all see me all right? Yeah. Yeah so I'm Josh I'm a technical support specialist at Liverpool Chirochem which is a tech chemical technology innovator founded in 2014 and we are on a mission to accelerate small molecule drug discovery by expanding access to 3D chemical space. And yeah, so we are delighted to be sponsoring this open source chemistry workshop on chem informatics and machine learning. It underpins much of the work done in chemistry. And if you work with chiral molecules, there is an extra layer of complexity needed to accurately, accurately describe molecules. Going this extra, extra step is core to what LCC is all about. So yeah, if you have any questions, please get in touch with us or visit our website at liverpoolchirochem.com. It's great to meet you all, and I hope you have. I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop. Okay, thanks very much. Well, we'll uh, pause the things for five minutes just to give people a chance to have a, a, a stretch the legs, and then we'll come back. Might as well just jump back in. Um, yeah. Just quick question. So we're we're an hour and a half into this, and I haven't even talked about any machine learning stuff at all. Um, is is everybody okay with maybe we'll just we'll skip over some stuff and then move into a little bit on machine learning now i think that's a good idea i mean the, the you you provided everybody with the notebooks and they had the introduction we can uh, uh you know people can then follow it up at their own pace okay yeah that's great um and you know, I'll, I'll put up my contact info at the end too, if anybody has any questions on any of the notebooks or <clears throat> anything like that, you know, feel free to, to get in touch. I'm, you know, happy to answer questions. But yeah, let's actually move into talking a little bit about machine learning now. So let me come back. All right, so what we're gonna do then is we're going to move over here and we're going to take a look at the tutorial 04, the decision tree method. And we're going to build a simple machine learning model. So let me just pop back to slides for just a second. Yeah, so what we're going to do here is we're going to build a simple decision tree. So this is one of the simplest machine learning models. So we're going to take a set of molecular descriptors. So these are the descriptors that are calculated by default by the RD kit. So we've got molecular weight, log P, you know, some descriptors that encode the flexibility of a molecule, the degree of aromaticity, aromaticity, et cetera. 
And what we want to do is then take some data on aqueous solubility. So we want to look at whether a molecule is soluble in water or not. And we want to build a predictor. And this predictor will be in the form of a decision tree. So if we take a look at what we have here, what we're looking at is if we take our data and we simply split it on log P at 3.24, you can see here are the molecules that have a log P less than 3.24. Here are the molecules that have a log P greater than 3.24. So what we can do from looking at this is you can see we've got this pie chart showing you the percentage of soluble molecules and insoluble molecules. So you can see just using this simple cutoff, we can get a reasonably good prediction of aqueous solubility. And we can go farther down then, and we can say, OK, well, if I split that data further on things like the polarizability of a molecule or using an additional log p cutoff, I can get to perhaps an even better predictor. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on math here. But what we're doing is we're looking at a variety of ways to split our data. And then we're using this measure called Gini impurity, which essentially just tells you, based on these pie charts, what fraction of that pie chart is a particular color. So it ranges between 0, which is only one class or one type here, versus 0.5, where everything is evenly distributed. So what we want to do is minimize the value of the Gini impurity for a particular split. So we're going to go through and say log P. If I do that at 1, what does my split look like? If I do it at 2, if I do it at 3. So let's go back now to the Jupyter Notebook and take a look at how we're going to do this in practice. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to import a bunch of libraries. We're going to use the pandas library for data table manipulation. We're going to use some of these descriptors that are available in the RD kit. We're going to convert our data to a log scale. So we need the math library. We're going to do some plotting with Seaborn. But the most important thing we're looking at here is this library. So this library is called scikit-learn. And scikit-learn is the most important machine learning library for Python. It has all sorts of functions for splitting your data into a training and test set for calculating a wide variety of models, for being able to do clustering, et cetera. So all of this is embedded in scikit-learn. I've got a couple of other libraries I'm using, this TQDM library that I really like, because when I'm running things, I like to have a progress bar to show me that things are actually working. Um, I'll show you how we can use this really cool D3 Viz library to visualize decision trees. And then finally, we're going to want to calculate some statistics on our model. So we are going to import a whole bunch of statistical functions, which are also available in scikit-learn. So scikit-learn lets you do a variety of processing on your data. It allows you to build the model, and it allows you to evaluate that model. So I'm just going to do that. I'm going to import this. I want to be able to have a progress bar. So there's this function in the TQDM library called tqdm.pandas that lets you have a progress bar when you're doing operations with pandas. Um, now what we're going to do is create a simple function that calculates a bunch of molecular descriptors using the RD kit. So I've got this function here. I give it a smile string. The first thing I do is convert that smile string into a molecule. I check to see if this molecule is valid. So there was a question in the chat about using, about figuring out whether molecules are valid. 
what will happen is if you try to create a molecule from a smile string and it's not a valid smile string, the RD kit will return none for that molecule. So I'm checking to see if this molecule is valid. If it is, I go through and calculate those molecular descriptors. I put those into a list that I'm calling the result. If that molecule isn't valid, I'm just going to create a list of five instances of none, just to see. So then what we're going to do is we're going to read this data. This is some data from a paper that on a method for solubility prediction called ESOL that was published by John Delaney. So I've got this data set and what I'm going to do is read that into what we call a pandas data frame. Now we didn't have time to get into the pandas part of this, but the way to think about the pandas data frame is it's like a spreadsheet that you can access in memory from Python. So what I'm doing is I'm reading in this comma delimited file and then I'm putting it into this table structure in memory that we call a data frame. So I'm going to read that. Let me show you what this looks like. So again, I'm going to do a state B to go insert a cell below. And if I just type DF, now I've got my data frame and I can see what's in there. So I've got the compound ID. I've got the measured log solubility. I've got what the predicted solubility is. And I've got my smile strings from my molecules. Now, what we really care about here is the smiles that we're going to use to create the molecular descriptors. And then I've got the measured value that I'm going to use to build my model. So the smiles will be used to calculate the descriptors, which will be our X. And this measured log solubility will be the Y. So then what we're going to do is we're going to ask the data frame, which columns do you have? Um, as you start accessing these columns, it's kind of painful when you've got column names that have spaces in them and parentheses and stuff. It just, I like to just have a shorthand that enables me to access these columns more easily. So one of the first thing I do is if I've got a column that has a name that's inconvenient to use, what I'll do is just change that to something more convenient. So I'm going to change measured log solubility molar into just log S. So what I do then is I ask the data frame for its columns, df.columns. Now that, that returns a data structure that I can't modify. So what I need to do is convert that into a list. Then I'm just going to say the first element in columns, I'm going to change to log S, and then I'm going to reassign the data frame columns to this list variable that I created. So now I've got a new column called log S. Now that I've got that, I'm going to add a new column to my data frame. So what I have is I've created a new column. So anytime you call a data frame with these square brackets and the name of a new column that's not in my data frame, it'll just create the column for me. So what I've done now is I've created a new column that just has a binary variable that indicates whether my molecule is soluble or not. Now I need to pick some cutoff for soluble versus insoluble. 200 micromolar is a convenient number to use. So what I'm going to do is I've got my, my solubility is already represented as a log. So I've got log S. So what I wanna do is compare that to 200 micromolar. So what I need to do is convert 200 micromolar to molar so I'm going to just say 200 times 10 to the minus 6, and I'm going to take the log base 10 of that, and then I can figure out what the solubility is. Now, when I tend to do things like this, and I do mathematical transforms in my head, or I'm coding something, 
invariably I screw it up and I do the unit conversion the wrong way. So the best way to figure out whether I did the unit conversion correctly is just to plot the distribution. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just do a distribution plot using Seaborn library again. On my X variable, I'm gonna put the experimental log solubility along the Y axis. I'm gonna just have the counts there. So it's a frequency distribution. And then I'm gonna color it by this new is soluble variable that I created. So you can see now, all of the soluble molecules are over on the right and they're colored in orange. The insoluble molecules are colored in light blue. So looks like I did a reasonably good job of splitting this. I plot it just to make sure it's okay. Now, what I wanna do is calculate those molecular descriptors. So you'll remember that I had this function that I defined up above called calc descriptors. So we've got this function that takes in a smile string and outputs a list of molecular descriptors. So I've got that. One of the really cool things that Pandas has is a method called apply. So what apply does is it'll take a column in your data frame. In this case, we've got a column that contains our smile strings. And we want to apply this method that we just created called calc descriptors to all the smile strings in that molecule, or I'm sorry, all the smile strings in that data frame. Now you can just call apply, but then you're going to have to wait a couple minutes and see that work and figure out, oh, and you kind of say to yourself, is that working or is it just stuck? Um, so one of the things I like about progress apply is it automatically puts a progress bar there when you call apply. So you'll see that if I hit shift return, oh, I need to just execute some of these functions up here now. So let me just go here. I'm gonna execute that, execute that. Created my calc descriptors. I read my CSV file. There's my data frame. I'm looking at the columns. I'm gonna change that column name just to make it easier to deal with. I'm gonna plot this. That looks good. Now you see that progress bar move across and you saw that I could see that. So, you know, with this particular data set, it's small. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. But if I was doing this with a table that had a million rows in it, I want to know that this is working. Um, so this is kind of interesting now though. So let's take a look at this data frame. Let's take a look at a couple of things actually, oops. Let me just shrink that back down a little bit, get rid of that. And I want to insert a cell below that. Yeah. So just a couple of things you can do with this data frame. So I can do df.shape and you can see it shows me how many rows and how many columns there are in that data frame. So if we just look at the data frame now, you can see that I've got, I've added a column called descriptor to my data frame, but that's not really what I want. I want to take those descriptors and I wanna split them out into their own columns. So you can just use this function here. Essentially, I've got the data frame, I've got this descriptor column. And if I use the to list function, what it'll do is take that list, expand it out into new columns. And then I get to what I wanted to have, so now if I just do insert a cell below again, and I do data frame, now you can see that all my descriptors are in their own frame, in their own columns, right? I've got molecular weight in a column. I've got log P, I've got number of aromatic rings. So this is all in with the descriptors in their own columns. Now, I don't need this column that had all the descriptors in it before. So we're just gonna get rid of it. And Pandas has a really handy function called drop that lets you just drop that column. Let's take one more look at, at the data frame now. Now you can see we've got our is soluble column that we added. We've got our molecular weight, log P, aromatic rings, hydrogen bond donors, and acceptors. So I've got all this. So this is great now. We can actually start to do something fun and build a model. So you'll remember what we talked about before. What we're gonna do is we're going to train our model 
on a subset of the data. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to split out 80% of the molecules and we're going to use those to train our model. And then we're going to hold back 10% as a test set. And we're going to use that to evaluate the performance of our model. So one of the great things, again, about scikit-learn is it has a really nice set of functions for splitting your data into a training set and a test set. So what I've done here is I've called that function on my data frame. So I can just use the whole data frame again, and I can split that out into training and test sets. So now if we take a look, let's just take a look at how big these are. If I do train dot shape and then I uh, comma test that shape then that gives you you know you can see we have 858 molecules in our training set and 286 molecules in our test set so now that we've got those we just need to only pull out the variables that we want so in this case remember we're going to build a model is soluble is our x variable and the remaining columns to the right of that molecular weight log p number of aromatic rings donors and acceptors that's going to be the x variable and the is soluble is going to be the y variable i'm not sure if i said that wrong so let me say it one more time is soluble is our y variable everything over here is our x variable so We've got the columns that define what our descriptors are. So if we look at that up above, if I just insert a column above and I do descriptor calls, then you can see those are our descriptors. So we're putting that into X and then our Y variable is the is soluble. We do the same thing with the test set. We set the test set to the descriptor columns. We set test set y variable to the is soluble variable one sort of bit of trivia here typically when you see people do this they'll use uppercase for the x and lowercase for the y and that just comes from linear algebra notation where we typically notate a matrix which is what your x variable is in capital letters and scalars which is what your y is in lowercase so now we've got our, our training set, we've got our test set, we split out what the X and Y are. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a classifier. So really easy um, in scikit-learn, you can just create a decision tree classifier. So you'll remember up above here, if you do from sklearn.tree, we imported the decision tree classifier. So now what we do is we create that classifier. Now you can have that classifier go to an arbitrary depth. One of the things, since we're gonna to try to visualize this, I don't want a super deep tree, so we're gonna do it in a relatively simple fashion. Now, let me go back to the slides for just a second because I think this is really important. Um, One of the really important things about building a machine learning model with scikit-learn and most packages now that you get are going to conform to the same convention that scikit-learn uses. So step one in building a machine learning model is splitting your training and test sets. So you know, your descriptors are gonna be your X, your experimental value is gonna be Y. Then you just create this model. So in this particular case, I've got a random forest regressor. Uh, so this should not say classification model, but just go with me. Then these models typically have two functions, one called fit. And in fit, you, you build the model, you train the model with fit. Then you do a prediction with predict. So then you just take the X from your test set and predict on that. So it's just a quick overview of what we're gonna do next. So you'll see now we created this classifier. It's 
created. Now, what we're going to do is we, we fit that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to predict on the test set. Then we're going to calculate some statistics. So we're going to calculate a statistic called the area under the receiver operating characteristic, which is a number between zero and one. If 0 0.5 is completely random predictor, if you build a model and your classifier <clears throat> has an AUC of 0 0.5, you need to go back and look at your data and your descriptors and see whether you're doing things right. We're going to calculate a couple of other statistics, the Matthews correlation coefficient, which again gives you a number between 0 and 1 tells you how good your classifier is. And then there's a metric called Cohen's Kappa, which is better for evaluating the performance of a classifier on imbalanced data sets. So, um, so you can see that we've done that now, we've built the model, we've evaluated the statistics on the model and the, <clears throat> there are a variety of ways of now visualizing this. So one way to visualize the performance of a classifier is using something called a confusion matrix. So in this confusing ma confusion matrix, what you want to do is have big numbers on the diagonal here, because this is telling you how many of your true examples you predicted correctly. So in this case, we're looking at solubility. It's telling us how many of the soluble molecules we predicted correctly. True negatives, we're looking at how many of the insoluble molecules we predicted correctly. And then on the other diagonal are false negatives and false positives. So you want those numbers to be smaller. You can then use these numbers to calculate additional statistics. But let's get back into the code and look at this. So you can see that we've got a function from scikit-learn that we can use to actually plot our confusion matrix. You can see we're doing pretty well because we have large numbers on the diagonals here, smaller numbers here, but you can use those to get in and start debugging. We have a, an area under the receiver operating characteristic of 0.89, which is very good. We've got good statistics here. You can also plot this, the curve for this receiver operating characteristic, which plots the false positive rate versus the true positive rate. And what you want is to increase the area under this curve again. 0.5 or random would essentially be a line along the diagonal here. So if you're close to that, you've got poor performance from your model. Um, the other things that, that are nice that you can do with this is there is a method in scikit-learn for actually plotting this decision tree and understanding the rationale behind the decisions that the models are making. So you can see it made its first split at a log P of 0.3. This is that Gini coefficient that we talked about. You remember, you know, closer to 0.5 means you've got an even split. It's showing you that with that split, you got 298 molecules in one cat category. 560 in the other, and then you can see how it continues to split. What I find a little more useful than this one, I mean, this one does give you some numbers that are useful, but I find it much more useful to use this dtree viz library, which creates what I think is a much easier to use representation. So, what we can do there is we call the dtree viz library, and then that will create this image, which I really like, because now it's showing you that, okay, the first split it did is based on log p, and you can see we got mostly 
soluble molecules in this bin and insoluble molecules in this bin, then what we can do is we can go down here and do an additional split based on molecular weight or an additional split based on an additional log P criterion. All right, so let's just go back to the slides for one second. Um, we've only got a couple more minutes, but I will just point to you what's in the final notebook. So this is great. And these decision tree mo models can be useful as a starting point. They're not the sort of thing that people use in practice because they tend to make rather naive splits and they're not gonna be as accurate. So what a lot of people use today and what, what I tend to use a lot is what's called ensemble methods. So what you're doing there is you're building multiple machine learning models, often hundreds of these decision trees using different starting points and different ways of constructing the tree and then looking at what the consensus prediction is across these trees. And you can use this for both classification and for regression. So if I'm actually trying to predict a value for solubility, you can do this. And if you look at a lot of the uh, data science competitions like Kaggle, a lot of these ensemble methods, so you'll hear about random forest or extreme gradient boosting, cat boost, light GBM. Um, and the, so I've got another notebook in here, which I don't think we're gonna have time to get to, that talks about light GBM and how you can use that to build a regression model. I've got lots more blog posts that walk through specific code examples on how to use these. So, um, you know, I think I'm gonna, I'm pretty much at time. So I'm gonna wrap that up there. Chris, do I have time to answer a couple more questions or? Uh, if you got, yeah, I would be great if you could answer a few of the questions. I've been answering a few of them as we've been going through, but there's a few there that I think might be, uh, require your expertise. Sure. Um, so, okay, there's a, there's a question here about using undersampling to construct a machine learning model. This is something, it, you know, it, it would take me an hour to, to really go through this. I will, on the GitHub page, I'll put a link to a couple of really good papers on handling imbalance data that actually have code examples. Um, yeah, this is, this is an interesting, the next question is about data augmentation. The, yeah, there, there's a problem here with, with data augmentation and there have been some papers and some methods for data augmentation, but you know, data augmentation is used widely in fields like image analysis. So you can blur an image, you can rotate an image. But the thing is, you know, you blur a picture of a cat or you rotate a picture of a cat and it's still a cat. You change one atom in a molecule and you can have a molecule that can have dramatically different properties. So I think data augmentation is really interesting, but I think there's still a, yeah, uh, there are still a lot of open questions there. Okay, why are we choosing to forego the validation data set? So if you look in lots of tutorials on machine learning and you look at um, you know, machine learning literature, you'll see a lot of cases where people don't simply split the data into a training set and a test set. They'll split into 
a training set, a validation set, and a test set. Typically, when you do that, what you're doing is you're going to train on your, valid, your training set. You're going to use your validation set to tune your model. Then you're going to test on the test set. We didn't do any model tuning today. So I didn't feel that it was necessary and I wanted to keep things relatively simple. You know, some methods like neural networks, it's very useful to have a validation set that you can use to tune the hyperparameters for your model. One of the things I like about these ensemble methods is that they tend to work really well out of the box. So, you know, I found that in many cases, um, they, you know, I usually just start with the default parameters here, and I find that I often get very good performance. And then maybe, you know, I'll tune a bit beyond that. And yes, to the, to the question, yes, if I didn't explain that career, clearly, Renforest, Extreme Gradient Boosting, Cat Boost, Light GVM are all ensemble methods. One of the things I've been very fond of, of light GBM recently, and one of the things I really like about it is that it's incredibly fast. So if you're dealing with very large data sets, I'm talking you know, hundreds of thousands of molecules and beyond, uh, I found light GBM to be much, much faster than something like random forest. Um, Yeah, so the next question, when you're working with ensemble methods, do you worry about the samples to descriptors ratio? I think the samples to descriptors ratio is kind of a holdover from the linear regression era. If you're taking a look at something like ensemble methods, they have their own ways of avoiding overfitting and you're doing variable selection implicitly. So I don't worry about that that much. And then when you're working with methods like neural networks, they have techniques like dropout to prevent overfitting. So I don't worry too much about the one to five ratio. I'd be more than happy to arm wrestle with anybody who wants to have a, more of a discussion that. Are there good free data sets for membranes, such as gas separation or filtration. That's outside my area. I'm sorry, I just don't know. I think we've uh, taken up uh, enough of your time now, uh, Pat. I think, uh, I, I, I think on behalf of all the people who have been uh, at this workshop, I'd like to thank you particularly for answering all those questions. There's been a huge number, and I think it just highlights how important this area is to chemistry. Um, there's lots of yeah. very great compliments coming through on the uh, on the chat. That a lot of people really uh, enjoyed this uh, thing and quite a lot number of people are asking can we have another one and I think uh, what you've done is just scratch the surface really this cheminformatics as we said earlier is critical for all areas of chemistry now and uh, it's it's absolutely essential that chemists have a, a grasp of um, programming and I think what you've shown with the Jupyter notebooks is that this is uh, a relatively easy entry for uh, chemists don't know what you think yeah, I, absolutely. I think it's I think it's great. I think there are just all kinds of tutorials out there now. You know, if, if if there's enough interest, I might start putting together videos. This was really a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to <laughs> everybody who was willing to put up with me for two hours. My apologies for any technical hiccups with binder. Everything is available from yeah. the GitHub site. I will do my best over the last, the next couple of days to put together a couple of documents with some additional links and some instructions on how to run all of this on your own computer. But I think that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Contact info. If you want to get in touch, please do. 
Yeah, I, th I think one of the really nice things about it is you actually doing it live because I think uh, it makes a huge difference from just looking at PowerPoint slides. I think uh, it makes makes us all realize that uh, actually typing things in live is a hugely pressurizing thing. And I think you did a fantastic job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very much a learn by doing kind of person. And this is one of the things that I'm really excited about is that a lot of papers in the field now, people are releasing code in Jupyter Notebooks along with this. And the fact that there are a lot of people out there putting out tutorials. So yeah, well, thanks I think, everybody. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think you uh, deserve to have a bit of a rest and maybe a, a, dr a drink of something to fortify you. Yeah, it's it, it's still eleven a.m. So maybe yeah. maybe a little later. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, maybe a cup of coffee then. Okay. All well, right. thanks very much. I'll close down the uh, webinar now. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, several people have asked. Uh, I'll I'll edit the YouTube video and then we'll put it on the CCAG channel. Uh, hopefully next week. Once again. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Once again, thanks for everything and uh, uh, thanks for a brilliant uh, workshop. Bye, everybody.